bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was a little hesitant to come back today because I have heard that you had a wonderful guest preacher last week. I thank Paul for uh, bringing the message in my absence and bringing such a powerful message from his heart and from his experience about something that we frequently don't talk about, that being mental illness and mental health challenges. And I hope that you've noticed a bit of a pattern here at Trinity this year in 2018. You may recall back in February when Kathy Smith shared from her heart and from her experience about a specific part of mental illness and mental health those who suffer from depression. And then a couple of months ago, I shared about another topic we don't frequently talk about, that being suicide and what we can potentially do about that. And then a couple of weeks ago, seems like almost years ago now, because the vacation was so good, but we talked about how Jesus has a vision for Trinity Baptist Church that I hope we catch, and that being a church that is accepting and merciful and forgiving and helpful to everyone in our community, no matter what the challenges they may be facing. Perhaps they're facing criminal histories and problems with that, or perhaps they're facing drug or alcohol addictions and struggles with that, or mental health struggles. We live in a broken world. And so, Paul, thank you for bringing that powerful message last week, and thanks all of y'all for allowing me to come back and to, again, fill God's pulpit here at Trinity Baptist Church. We're in the next to the last sermon in our series of God's Kingdom in Action, drawn from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And again, three weeks ago, a couple of weeks before I left for vacation, we looked at Jesus' summary of the sermon, specifically chapter 7, verse 12, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. And Jesus goes on to say, not only is this summarizing my sermon to this point, it summarizes all of the law and the prophets. All of God's scripture known to Jesus and his listeners in that day boils down to, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now certainly there's more to that, that needs to be unpacked, and that's what Jesus had been doing for a couple of chapters that we've looked at, and then Jesus goes on to begin his conclusion, where he reiterates some of the stronger, more significant points. And last, or two weeks ago, my last sermon, we started looking at that conclusion. And that conclusion consists of three warnings each contrasting two alternative ways or courses of action. Make sure that you get through the gate. It's not a very wide gate, and the way behind that gate is not an easy one. That's the sermon that we looked at. That's the choice and the warning that we looked at 
two weeks ago. Today we'll look at two more. Watch out for people who may lead you off that path, off that road, and don't think that just because you've been tagging along with others that you're going to get there in the end. They're sobering warnings, and we need to take them seriously. But you see, Scripture can be difficult. One of the challenges of being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that God expects us, as a friend of mine in seminary quoted a professor of his from his undergraduate days, God expects us to love him from the top of our heads to the bottom of our hearts. And you see, I think sometimes in today's church and in today's world, we maybe get the heart stuff right. We get the emotional feelings from the music and from the worship experience. But then when we start trying to look at Scripture with our heads and trying to take Jesus' teaching seriously, we struggle. We struggle because... Sometimes it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand because of cultural differences or language differences or just obscure passages. We don't know exactly what maybe Jesus is saying. That's the head part that God wants us to work through. But let's be honest, it's also difficult because even frequently when we understand it clear as day, we don't want to do it. It's difficult to obey. And as we've already talked about, the Sermon on the Mount is a prime example of both of those things. It's probably Jesus' best known teaching, yet at the same time, it's probably the least understood and the least obeyed by people both in and out of the church. Of course, I almost slipped up there by saying in and out of the church because one thing that we frequently forget is when God talks about God's law and obeying God's law and following Jesus' teachings, ultimately that's for those of us who are believers and are seeking to follow Jesus. That's not standards for the outside world. In fact, Jesus teaches, as Paul recounts, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we cannot meet God's standards without God's help through Jesus Christ. So when we look at the world around us and expect the world to meet Jesus' standards, we've got it all wrong. We need to be looking inside ourselves and inside the church to see if we're meeting God's standards and setting the example so that then those who don't yet belong to God, who don't yet know the gift of Jesus Christ and forgiveness through God's grace in Jesus Christ, drawing them to us and to Jesus through us. That's where we are in today's passage. And today's passage is a difficult one. It's a little puzzling to look at and try and figure out what's Jesus talking about, about this false prophets versus real prophets and this fruit being either good or bad. I think maybe we can grasp some of that and we'll unpack that and look at it. But then the one that gets hard is when Jesus says, there are going to be those in Judgment Day who are going to come and say, Lord, Lord. They're going to profess Jesus as Lord with their mouths. And they're going to say, didn't we do great miracles? Didn't we draw great crowds to our churches? Didn't we hold big evangelistic meetings and have hundreds come to the altar? And didn't we have great television ministries? Maybe even good charitable ministries. And Jesus is going to say, Go, depart from me, I never knew you. 
Hard words. Lord, Lord, and doing great things, professing them to be in Jesus' name, yet something's going to be missing. You see, I think it boils down in many respects to something I struggled with in my last semester in seminary and really still struggle with today, though I think I'm a lot clearer on it. And those of us who grew up Baptist, those of us who grew up in what's known as the evangelical church, that being the church that's concerned about personal salvation and personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we talk about the gospel all the time. We talk about sharing the gospel in the world. And the question that I started asking, what is the gospel? That's not the exact subject of the sermon today. In fact, I've talked some on that topic. We've talked about the gospel in connection with the Sermon on the Mount. In its essence, the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ brought in the Sermon on the Mount is that I am God, and in my person, God is breaking into human history to bring about change, to bring about God's kingdom on earth, to start making things operate the way God wants them to operate. And I'm inviting you, as followers of God, to come on board. And then ultimately, it will all be perfected when God's kingdom comes for permanent residence here on earth. The gospel is more than simply making a decision or seeking a decision. The gospel is more than simply seeking a profession of faith. The gospel is more than a relationship. And I'm going to stick my hands up real big because I'm a very relational, both person by personality, but also very relational in my theology. But it's more than a relationship. You see, the gospel is about making a decision, professing faith as a result of that decision, entering into a relationship that transforms who we are and how we act in the world around us. That's the entire message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I promise you I was going to get to why I'm wearing Braves gear today besides celebrating their victory yesterday. You see, it hit me clear as day as I was acting like a fanatic at the uh, Braves game, celebrating their victory, that the process of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ is not unlike the process of becoming a fan of a sports team. You see, I made a decision at some point that I was going to follow the Atlanta Braves. And I professed that I wanted to follow the Atlanta Braves. And then I started taking action. I bought tickets to go to the games. I guess, first of all, I listened to them on the radio. I remember being a young child under the age of 10 or so and being supposed to be in bed and slipping the radio. Y'all remember those old transistor radios that some of us had under the pillow and listening to the ball games at night. And then perhaps we start adding paraphernalia. We buy the jerseys and we start looking the part as we're entering into a relationship with the team. And then that relationship starts adding things that we collect to reflect the relationship with the team. And then that relationship grows and it begins transforming the way we act. I used to travel a lot giving seminars throughout the country 
And that was back in the 90s when the Braves were going to the postseason every year. And I had one rule when people would come up to me and say, can you come to our event? I would ask, is it during October? And if the answer is yes, I'd say, I'm sorry, I can't. You see, it was transforming. That relationship was transforming the way I act. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is far more serious than our relationship with the sports team, but we've all been through that process with something, be it a sports team, be it a job, be it a human relationship with a spouse or a friend, where you make a decision then you start acting on that decision to enter a relationship. That relationship begins to transform you and it transforms the way you act. That's what Jesus is saying today in his passage. He's saying, beware of false prophets. And it is a warning to stay away from people who are fake and phony that may lead you off the path but the implicit message Jesus is also saying is test yourself. Look at your own fruits to see whether you are false or real. You see, our beliefs, faith and otherwise, will impact the way we act. Our lives will have fruits. The question is, are they good fruits or are they bad fruits? That's the test that Jesus is talking about. You see, the word <coughs> excuse me, that Matthew uses for fruits means outcome or results or deeds. How we live matters, and who we follow matters. True loyalty to God inevitably results in appropriate behavior by God's people. If our behavior doesn't reflect who we belong to, that being God, then Jesus is saying we maybe need to rethink who we belong to. Do we belong to God or do we belong to ourselves? Are we doing things, even if we're busy in the church, even if we're busy in society, even if we're doing what we call good things, do we belong to God or to somebody else? That gets us to our tougher passage where Jesus says there are going to be those who say, Lord, Lord. But Jesus gives the clue where he says, Depart from me, I never knew you. Remember, it's a process, a three or maybe four step process to being Jesus' disciple. The decision's first and foremost because it's the beginning that leads to the profession of faith and trust in Jesus' acceptance of God's gift of forgiveness through Jesus and then entering into a relationship that transforms the way we act, the fruits that we bear. But you see, simply the fruits, the acts by themselves aren't enough. There's been a controversy the last few weeks in the religious community, and it's not a new controversy. It's been around for quite a while, but it's gotten more attention lately because a group of pastors set forth a statement on social gospel in the churches. And I'm sorry, since I stepped away from my notes, I hadn't memorized the exact title. I don't think that's quite it, but it's, it's social gospel in the faith. And they come from a line of thinking that would stress the decisional end of that spectrum but where their critiques have some value is that there are a lot of people that say we should be running around doing good things in Jesus' name, 
seeking to help the poor, seeking to cure racism, seeking to remedy sexism, seeking to bring about equal treatment for people, but they're doing it on their own power without the relationship and without the transformation through Jesus Christ. We need it all. And indeed, I would posit that ultimately we can't have true acts of justice without making the decision and then being transformed. Because inherently we are all sinful, we are all selfish, and ultimately even if we're running around saying we're doing good, we're really doing it for ourselves. I'll go ahead and raise my hand. I lived much of my life that way when I really got down to it. I would have told you much of my life that I was a pretty decent guy, that I really had service and public service at my heart, and that I was trying to help you, but I'd get very disappointed if I didn't get the pat on the back. I maybe didn't have a financial motive or a misuse of you motive, but I sure wanted that big pat on the back. How great you are. Jesus calls us to do what's right because it's right. Jesus calls us to enter into such a close relationship with Him and with our Heavenly Father God that we cannot help but act the way God and Jesus wants us to act. And here's where the critiques of social justice get it wrong. If that decision doesn't lead to a relationship, you ain't saved. That's what Jesus just said. I never knew you. And even if it enters into a relationship, if that relationship doesn't change the way we act, then there's something wrong with that relationship and it's still broken. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 25, when judgment day comes, the king will divide his subjects into those who are in, that being the sheep, and those who are out, that being the goats. How? By the way they treat others. Let's loop back to the sermon two weeks ago. The law and the prophets, Jesus said, can be summed up in a phrase. Do to others the way you would have them do to you. Now that's not just a hollow phrase because we're also called, as we do to others, to do to others through love. Not just human love, but godly love, because God is love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, following up really on what Jesus says in verses 21 through 23 in today's passage. If I could speak all languages of earth and of angels, but don't love others, I'd just be a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, if I can do great things and understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and even had faith that it made it appear I could move mountains, but don't love others, I would be nothing. If I have the power to give everything to the poor and even sacrifice my gut body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. You see, God is Love. God's people are being transformed into being like God and loving others. So how will others 
View your actions and your fruits. Do the way you treat those around you reflect God's love? I'm going to really step out there in today's world. Do the way you treat people whose political views you find despicable reflect God's love? Do the way you treat people that Paul preached about last week who act funny, act different, we would call are weird, reflect God's love? Does the way you treat people who don't look like you, who maybe aren't from this country, who maybe aren't of your socioeconomic standard or your educational standard, does it reflect God's love? If you can't say yes, pray. So how can we build on this relationship? I look around this congregation and I know most if not all of you and I think virtually everybody here has at least at one time professed a decision to want to follow Jesus Christ. So how can we move from that decision toward that relationship that transforms the way we act we need to spend regular time with Jesus. How can you have a relationship with somebody you never spend any time with? We need to spend time with Jesus in prayer, spend time with Jesus in studying His Scripture, spend time with Jesus by being with other disciples. That's what we're doing here today, is we're joining together to try and help and support one another as we seek to serve Jesus and know more about Jesus and be in that relationship so that when push comes to shove, Jesus will say, I know you. And as we spend this time going to ball games, collecting paraphernalia, praying, reading scripture, hanging out with other disciples, it's going to start changing the way we live. Sunday mornings are going to maybe start becoming a priority. Getting up in the morning and spending time in prayer and Bible reading and study will become a priority. When people ask us to do something that interferes with our faith walk, we will have the power and desire to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I have another obligation. And most of all, when it's tempting to go along with the crowd, when it's tempting to demean other people for their looks, for their beliefs, for their faith habits, for their mental condition, for their past mistakes, whatever it may be, we're going to stand up and say, Stop! If you're going to act that way, I'm out of here. Imagine a world, a world where God's kingdom is coming. Imagine a church that puts God's kingdom first. A church that is known in its community in Rockdale County, Georgia, as a church that is accepting of everyone. No matter what your issues, no matter what your baggage, you're accepted. Known as a church that is merciful, a church that is forgiving, a church that is helpful, regardless of issues and baggage. A church that says to the world, to the broken, to the hurting, to the oppressed, we accept you right where you are. We invite you to join us in following Jesus. Join us in denying our self-interest 
and being filled with God's Spirit so that we can truly treat others the way we'd like to be treated. Join me in prayer. Oh God, forgive us when we fall short. Forgive us when we don't seek your way and your will. But Father, for most of us, we get that part right. We at least act like we're trying. Father, forgive us when our actions are more about how we look than about how you look through us. Lord, this is a tough world to live in. There are people who don't like us. There are people whom we don't like. But Father, we thank you that you loved us even when we were unlovable, even when we were thumbing our nose at you, saying we don't need you. Help us to love others the way you do. Most of all, help us to love ourselves enough that we can freely accept your grace, your forgiveness, your love, and make that so much a part of every fiber of our being that it can't help but overflow to those around us. Just like Jesus' love flowed out on the cross when he looked down at those spitting and cursing and murdering him and said, Father, forgive them for you and I love them. It's in his name we pray. Amen.